Why you should welcome high interest rates. Man, I tell you, man, I am so happy that the interest rates are where they are now. <clears throat> I don't think they're going to go much higher than this. I don't think they're going to go higher than this at all. This is good. Um, <laughs> this is really good. High interest rates reward savers. Low interest rates reward debtors. An economy built on debt is an economy that's doomed to fail. That's all there is to it. But Josh, how does companies get their investment money without low interest rates? Yeah, what happens is the banks becomes a lot more prudent in loaning out money. And because they're more prudent, they're only loaning out to people who qualify for debt with collateral and cash flow. When I was in banking, it's like the three or four C's of debt as a character, collateral, cash flow, and something else. I forgot what the other C was. And uh, you didn't just loan any freaking, you know, swinging, uh, swinging D-I-C-K who could fog a mirror. You had to make sure that they followed these three to four C's, character, credit, cash flow, and something else. I just can't remember. Anyway, so what's happening now is now more prudent lending is done, more conservative lending is done because banks say, hey, I'm borrowing at five, we'll just say, I'm going to loan to you at seven. If you can't pay that debt off, guess what? I'm still on the hook for borrowing at five. I can't just raise that money easily on the open market via deposits because remember, deposits are a liability to the bank. All right. Just keep that in mind. When you uh, send it, when you, it's called time deposit account, TDA. That means it has a time on there. A DDA is a demand deposit account, which means I can demand my money whenever I want. A time says, no, you can't demand it whenever you want. There's a time. So when I'm borrowing, when I'm loaning the bank at 5%, we'll just say that as a TDA, a CD account. Now they're turning around and lending that out at seven. If that 7% can't be paid back because they lent it to some freaking clown, you know, who could fog a mirror, guess what? They're still on the hook to me at five. Where do they get the other reserves and wish to pay me back? Well, they have to go to the Fed open window and all this stuff. Well, guess what? The Fed open window says that's great, but the interest rates you have to pay RS or 6%. The bank can't do that. They can't. So they inherently have to be more prudent. Or they can say, you know, it'll be like Capital One. We'll go into the open markets and raise money through uh, open uh, uh, brokered CDs and whatnot. That's why I always get nervous when the CD rates are significantly higher than the market in a brokered CD because like, why are they offering so much higher interest rates What's going on there? Uh, because they've been a lot more uh, suspect, if you will, about their lending patterns. And of course, we're rewarding them by basically allowing the Fed Reserve, the FDIC, to cover every single deposit. It's insane. It, there's no money to do this. It's pure insane. Anyway, so I'm reading this right quick. And this is uh, this, I love this book so far. Um, the Price of Time. Uh, just this, like, literally, it's like dop dopamine to me. I just love this stuff. I, I don't know why. I always have. I love economic history, economic theories. Um, and one of the things this guy talks about is having returned to the gold standard a couple years earlier at a level which left sterling overvalued against the U.S. dollar, Britain's economy was now trapped in an economic depression. I'm like, as in after World War I, I'm like, why? Why returning to the gold standard, i.e. make your dollar more valuable relative to the other currencies out there, would bring you in an economic depression. There's a, see, this is where these economic historians, they say this happened, but they don't say why it happened. And there's no legitimacy to that. You can't say, oh, they have a high value of their dollar, which brings you an economic depression. I mean, what we'd argue an old Keynesian mechanism here is you say, oh, man, now because they, their cost to basically export their goods is too high, the cost to export their goods is too high, they're hurting manufacturing. That's what they say. And, and you say, oh, my goodness, so we better lower the value of our dollar so we can compete against, the, again, in this case, the United States, because it says right there, they overvalued against the U.S. dollar. The U.S. dollar had cheap money, cheaper money relative to the U.K. because the U.K. was stronger. The U.S. was an emerging market. And as such, the U.S., the U.K. was in a depression. I, I don't buy that for two seconds flat. I think that's silly, actually, um, especially after World War I just kicked in. They used all the resources of men and treasure to basically take on the Germans and saw them. What the hell was that about? It's freaking nuts, dude. Anyways, part two of this is, and here's our bankers. Benjamin Strong was a scumbag. I don't care what anybody says. He was a close friend of the eccentric Norman, Mont or Montague Norman, who is also the, uh, so Benjamin Strong was the U.S. Federal Reserve chairman back then, scumbag. Norman, or Montague Norman was a U.K. version of their uh, Federal Reserve chairman, who's a former patient of Carl Jung, or Jung. Uh, okay, and here's uh, Norman who attended the conference of the elite bankers in Long Island, attired in his trademark velvet cape 
and wide-brimmed soft hat. The world's two most prof- powerful central bankers, Benjamin Strong and uh, freaking Montague Norman, often enjoyed holidays together, booking into resort hotels under his assumed name so as not to attract attention. Dude, these guys are all clowns. This is, a freaking, this is the beginning of the 57 flavors. You can see that a mile away. All freaking scumbags. So anyway, what happens is here is they have too much power. Too much power. And so when you are so focused on low interest rates, and I'm telling you, you're going to say, where is this going, Josh? Trust me, you got to hang in there. It's so obvious. When you're so focused, consumed with low interest rates to grow the economy by issuing essentially fiat currency to everyone who can fog a mirror and hoping that somebody's going to stick for growth, dude, all you're doing is you're pulling consumption forward. That's all you're doing. You're basically saying, hey, there is no incentive to save America, so go ahead and borrow or, or to leverage or go ahead and consume right now. But there's no incentive to save. That's not good for a long-term economy. It's just not. You're punishing the savers and rewarding the debtors. All right, so what happens every single time this happens? Well, it says it right here on the very next page. Very next page. All right. So it says, uh, in the early, uh, once the war was over and the country demobilized, inflation took off. This is the United States by now. So this is after World War I. Once the war was over and the country demobilized, inflation took off. Oh, by the way, this is my Sabbath video as FYI. So for you guys watching this, recognize, watch the end of the video because you know that if I make any money on this YouTube channel on this day, on Sundays, modern day Sabbath for Christians, if you will, uh, the money will be donated at the end of the year to a pregnancy center. So last Sunday's video, I made 110 bucks, dude. 110 bucks. That's all going to a pregnancy center at the end of the year. So we'll calculate it all up and we'll do a video on how much we made. So watch this and promote it because the more people watch, the more we give to pregnancy centers. All right. So the Federal, uh, the Federal Reserve's response uh, after uh, inflation of 1919-1920 was, uh, was, uh, was brutal and brutally effective. In early 1920, the New York's discount window was hiked from 4.5 to 7%. Commodity and consumer prices collapsed. Industrial production contracted by a quarter. And 500 banks failed. Why would these banks fail? Why would production collapse? Because people were rewarded to borrow. That's why. Huh. Did that destroy the whole world? No, it cleaned out the dry wood, the kindling in a forest, which is why we need to allow forest fires, by the way, because you have all this kindling. It's just dry wood. It needs to get burned out. And when it gets burned out, the growth after that is just strong and beautiful. Fall Tony Heller's channel. He'll give you a perfect example of that. He'll show you five years ago, this, this forest was burnt clean because lightning strikes, because some clown you know, lit a match, a smoke a cigarette, something like that. Now it's thriving of growth, of nature, of beauty. So this is exactly what happens. You're cleaning out the dead wood. It sucks for some, not for all. Commodity and price and consumer price collapse, industrial production contracted by a quarter, 500 banks failed in the ensuing economic downturn. Harry Truman's business failed. The sharp deflation was warmly welcomed by the New York Fed, uh, who said, we hold, this is William Harding, we hold that the shrinkage which has taken place is somewhat analogous, analogous, whatever it is, to that which occurs when a balloon is punctured and the air escapes. Yep. Huh. But guess what? The U.S. economy bounced out of the Depression in 1922 because Silent Cow said, I'm not touching this. We'll just let it work itself out, burn the dead wood. And in 1922, its profits soared accompanied by the largest improvement in U.S. productivity ever recorded. Huh. So what is this good for you as a, as a saver, not a lender? Because you're getting rewarded to hang tight while the freaking deadwood ultimately will get burned. Dude, there are more, what did I, what did I just read today? That there is more corporate bankruptcies these first two months of 2023 than there have been since 2011. It's not even close either, by the way. The dead wood is being burned. This is, I tell you, it's going to suck. But if you have no debt and you're sitting in cash and CDs, you can ride it out. It's a wonderful place to be. You say, I don't need to worry what the stupid Fed is doing because I got my safe money here. I can live off my safe money. The safe money most likely will always lag that of inflation as we calculate inflation by CPI, which is stupid. So don't do that. All these people are going to say, but Josh, 
I'm only getting 5% the bank, and inflation is 8%. Oh, my goodness, I'm losing money. Like inflation based on what? Well, based on CPI, because that's what everyone measures inflation on. <sighs> Why are you using CPI in your own personal inflation? Why? It makes no sense. Don't do that. You look at your own personal inflation and with the stuff that you spend to maintain your standard of living. I don't know what your inflation will be. It might be higher than that. It might be lower. I don't know. But to look at CPI as 8%, and I'm only getting 5% of the bank, thus I can't be in bank, it's just frankly stupid. Don't be stupid, man. I'm not welcome here. Now, it could be ignorant, but if you've been on this channel long enough, ignorance is no longer your excuse. Ignorance means you just don't know. Okay, you can say my personal inflation is 8% because of electricity, because of my food and all that. I get that, but then I said, what's your expenditures? Because your personal inflation rate is just how much, it, how much they increase and maintain your standard of living. So let's say your expenditures are 30,000 bucks, all right, just for simplicity. And you're going up by, for simplicity, 10%. So it got, went from 30,000 to 33,000 bucks, all right? So your personal inflation is 10%, and you're only getting 5% at the bank. Yeah, but the bank, you got a million dollars. So at the bank, I'm just using this for an example, dude. At the bank, your 5% netted you 50,000 bucks, all right? Your personal inflation only costs you $3,000. You got to look at it in dollar terms, dude. And in dollar terms, to be the saver is uh, high interest rates just make everything better, man. And it's about time. It's been it's been low inflation, low inflation, low interest rates. I mean, I just I can't even remember even talking about it, telling people go buy a CD at the bank. It's been so long. It's so wonderful. It's, I mean, it's literally weird, man. In my career, well over half of my career since 1998 when I started this has been in low inflationary, uh, low uh, CD interest rate model where there was no alternative because you're saying the CDs are paying two and that's locking up your money for three years and you got to pay tax on that money as ordinary income. And now you can say, no, but the CDs are four and five and fixed annuities are five. And fixed annuities are tax deferred, which means you don't have to pay income tax to pull the money out. And then if you pull the money out when you're retirement, you got no other income, just Social Security and some Roth IRAs, you pull the money out of your uh, fixed annuity, say 20000 bucks. I mean, you're basically tax-free there too. High interest rates make retirement beneficial. I'm telling you, it's what we need. And I cannot be happier. Yeah, dude, I'm telling you, this slowdown's coming, man. You can see it in my... I'll do another video on that later today. Just a, in the obvious nature of the slowdowns that are here. But... It's burning the dead wood. It's going to be tough. If you have liquidity and cash, you can survive it. And that doesn't mean the stock market isn't going to perform. I mean, again, whenever they lay off people, the stocks go boom. You're like, that doesn't make any sense. Yeah, because the short-term numbers are looking good whenever they lay off people because the employees are the biggest cost. But that's not long-term growth necessarily. It's just not. <sighs> anyway, be thankful for high interest rates. It's a wonderful thing. All right, love your thoughts. We'll see you.